Welcome to Capital Preview, a weekly bipartisan discussion with Iowa legislators about the key issues facing our state. Brought to you by Mediacom. Welcome to another edition of Capital Preview, brought to you by Mediacom. I'm Bill Peard, and I'll be your host as we discuss important issues with our state representatives. And our, our uh, state senator uh, guest today is Senator Jerry Bain from Boone. And Jerry, thanks for coming. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Good to talk to you. I'm going to. Uh, I'm just going to just jump right in here, um, okay. Jerry. I know that. Um, I know that you have a couple issues that you are um, interested in up that's happening at the state house this year or this session. And I know coupling is kind of um, near and dear to you right now. So if you, you kind of go it, through it, and it explain. really is. And I got to just a little backdrop to what's going on. Traditionally, the federal government changes rules in the tax code. And in Iowa, either goes ahead and, and copies what they did or not. And we refer to that as coupling. So if the feds do one particular area of the code, we couple and, and copy it, make sure it's exactly the same. One of the things that they did at the federal level is, is a uh, provision called Section 179. And that really affects small business owners in the state. And, and quite frankly, by definition, it's small business because there's a limit on the amount of assets that it covers, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, it changes the way um, individuals and business owners can depreciate their assets, all right? Now that doesn't sound like a big deal, but once you've made the change and the feds did it, most of the businesses in anticipation of Iowa coupling, like we traditionally do, mm -hmm. made those purchases. Now if we don't couple, it's going to have a huge impact on those businesses. And I, I, I brought an email with me just to share with you so I could put sure. some real word numbers with that. Absolutely. And she goes on to say that if Section 179 is not approved, not only will we have to pay an additional $18,000 in Iowa taxes, but Iowa will penalize me for not paying the correct amount of estimated taxes. Now, if that's not a double kick, oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know what is. Yeah. Because right. Anyway, so the point is, once we've set up a, a tradition of coupling, I think it's very important that we continue that. Several years back, you might remember, we did a listening tour across Iowa and we talked to small business owners and job creators. And I gotta, I gotta remind everybody that 60 to 70% of all job creation is, is created by small businesses. So we're talking about the small businesses here and this affects that and it affects their ability to hire more individuals and it affects their ability to, to increase their business. So this is, this is big time stuff for them. And one of the things that they told us several years ago is let's get consistency. Mm -hmm. What we really can't handle <clears throat> is when you change the rules in the middle of the game. Well, this is a classic example of changing the rules in the middle of the game. And it, that's a real world example from a real world, real world small business owner that's saying, hey, it's going to make a difference. So in the budget, uh, they refer to it as about a $90 million um, revenue change. Well, that's code for raising taxes on small business owners in the state. So I think it's absolutely vital that we couple. I'm, I'm working extremely hard on my, my compatriots in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I think it's taken on a little bit of a, a partisan thing. I, I think the Democrats have said that they really don't want to couple because of the $90 million tax or, or the, the revenue adjustment that right. they would have to make. Yep. And I think one of the things they want to do is just roll that money over into schools. So they're gonna argue that if you don't do it, it's taken away from the revenue from the schools. I would argue uh, that's not money that the state ever should have had. Right. So it's not something that you can say, oh, we've got it now, so let's go ahead and spend it. That's just, it's just not right to stab those business owners in the back. And I think that's what it's doing. And I know that's pretty strong, but I, I really feel it's important. I think it's just the right thing to do to couple. We've been doing it in the past we should do it now. So I'm gonna to continue to push for that and that, that is a big hot button topic. I've gotten a lot of emails very similar to this young lady's circumstance and I think it's important that, that, that we talk about that. Uh, that leads us just a, a, a little bit into the um, education funding. Um, the, the House passed 2% allowable growth That's or, and supplemental state aid is what they call it now and it used to be allowable growth. That's $90 million of brand new money. So it's over and above the several billion that we pay every year. And then the supplemental state aid is a supplement to that amount that we're paying. Well, anyway, 2% is $90 million. 4% that the Senate passed would be $180 million. 
So there's right now there's about a $90 million discrepancy between the two. That's what's holding it up. It's in a conference committee right now. Hopefully they can get something ironed out. And from the school district standpoint, I know they'd, they'd obviously rather have the four. The right, 180 million. Absolutely. But even yep. if they can, even if they can only get the 90 million, I say only, kind of in parentheses. 90 million is still a lot of money, particularly when you figure our student population is stagnant, and in some instances it went down. Now I think over the last couple of years it's gone up just slightly, but the real issue, Bill, in all these in these communities is declining enrollment. You get paid per pupil. Mm -hmm. All right. So yep. if you have if you had 1,000 students last year and you only got 980 this year, you got 20 less students, and you multiply that by the state aid, which is around six, $7,000 a, a student, that's where the problem is. And that kind of goes back to my first argument on coupling of why we should do that. When those small business owners don't make it, right. and they leave those communities, then those school districts have their declining enrollment. One of the best things yeah. we can do to keep that from happening. Kind of a vicious cycle. It, it is it? exactly a vicious cycle. And so that's why it's such a big deal to me. And that's why I think we got to really promote the small businesses and be sure that Iowa is friendly to them. Absolutely. Uh, not unfriendly, for lack of a better phrase. So yeah. I, I, in order to handle the declining enrollment, I, I think the, the businesses are a big issue and job creation is a big issue. And I think that's one of the things we can do to help it. So I'm going to continue to push for the coupling. And I think that'll help with the the student or the um, aid for schools also. I mean, that example you use, uh, I mean, that's that's tough for a small business. Oh, $18,000 of expenses that you weren't planning on right. is probably half of a full-time position. Right, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, you multiply that over a couple of years, if they, if they know that, but again, it's planning. If they had known about it in the front part of the year, right. They either wouldn't have made that expense, they or they wouldn't have. They would, could have adjusted their income in some circumstances. So mm -hmm. again, it's the planning, and that's what I object to as much as anything is. We're kind of closing the door after the horse ran out of the barn. We ought to be. We ought to be making it so that it is predictable. And this kind of unpredictability is hard for everybody. So, I think we should do what the feds did. The feds made it permanent. I think we should just say the same thing. We're going to automatically couple. And it would take an act of the legislature not to couple, right? And, and put it and put it in that mode rather than the way it is now, where every year we got to talk about it, every year we got to bring it up, every year we yeah. got to decide: are we gonna, are we not gonna? Blah. We should just make it where we automatically couple. And if there's some extraordinary circumstances where we can't, then it would take an act of the legislature to make it happen. That's very interesting, Jerry. That's a that's a great example of of things that we can do to improve our business climate. I Iowa. think I think it is. I think I, I really do think it is. So, Jerry, I know I know another one of yours is the ninety nine uh, percent spending limit in right. our constitution. Right. We we have that right yeah. now in state law. Yeah. And as you know, there's a fancy word they use under the Golden Dome called notwithstanding. <laughs> I'd never heard that word before I got involved in politics. <laughs> it, there's there's no notwithstanding out on the farm, you know. <laughs> but under the Golden Dome, we can say. Notwithstanding the 99% spending limitation, since we're lawmakers, we're not going to abide by it, and we can spend more than we than that if we want to. Right. Okay. Yep. Uh, the Constitution is the only document in Iowa that we cannot notwithstand. Okay. Yep. So I think it would be very important, and I'm I'm strongly in favor of putting that to the vote of the people. As you know, you can't change the Constitution without a vote of the people, and it takes two successive legislative processes. So we can't even pass it this year. And have it go to the oh uh, really people you have okay. to you have to pass it this year yep. and again next year, and that would be after an election. So it'd be a different group of senators and a different group of, of house members. They really make you work for they it. They make you they? work for it. So you got to yeah. pass two separate two separate. Uh, uh, I suppose sets. that's a, a good build-in safeguard. But I think I think it absolutely yeah. is. Yeah. I, it helps keep us out of the issue that the federal government gets into. You know, the federal government can just print money. Right. We can't do that. And we, I, I want to be sure that we don't spend more than we take in. I, that's a that's a big deal to me. I know a couple things. We're kind of running out of time here a little bit, but those have been great discussion items. Um, I know a couple quick things that the photo ID to vote. We're photo ID to vote. You, you got to you so got to you got to you got to have a photo ID to open a bank account. You got to get one for an airplane. You, I mean, yeah, even to cash a check or or sometimes even to use a credit card. You got to have a photo ID. Most right. people already have them. Right. I do not believe it would be a significant hindrance to voting. And I also would submit to you, I, I hear the word uh, disenfranchising. 
You ever heard that? Where people oh, yeah. Like, oh, we don't want to disenfranchise. Notwithstanding. Yeah, right. yeah, there you go. It's another <laughs> fancy term, disenfranchise. Yeah, exactly. My comment would be, I think you disenfranchise voters more if they can't trust the system. And I think a photo ID would put faith back in the system. I know we had an instance where there were more voters showed up than we had ballots. And I think one of the things that you can do to be sure there's integrity in the system is have a photo ID. So I think that's one of those no-brainer things, and I think we should pursue that. Yep. Um, well, real quickly, um, we're running out of time here, but um, we want to maybe you want to talk a little bit about the um, residency, the proof of legal residency right, for right. welfare. That would that Just would be a, that would be briefly. another I, I think a, a, a no-brainer thing is is to prove that you're a legal resident before you can get uh, food stamps or any other kind of aid. I, I just think that's appropriate too. So that's another one of the things we're, we're pushing on. My anticipation is it won't make the funnel, but uh, that, that we're going to continue to push for it. Oh, very good. Well, thank you, Senator. Oh, it's great, my pleasure. Great conversation. Thank uh, you very much. Please join us uh, for our, our next episode of <laughs> Capital Preview. I'm Bill Peard, and thank you for watching.